From Microbe TV, this is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode 33, recorded on July 24th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Utah, Nels Eldi. Good afternoon from Eldi Lab Studios, and happy Pioneer Day. What's that? <laughs> so this is a local uh, holiday that we're celebrating here in Salt Lake, I guess the state of Utah. It's a little bit like uh, 4th of July, version 2.0. Uh, hmm. There's a lot of fireworks, parades, and whatnot. And this is, I guess, uh, looking back, sort of the settling of the Salt Lake Valley and uh, um, sort of celebrating those uh, days. Uh, the, in the, I should say the Mormons settling, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. um, how the history goes. Turns out, so us uh, so-called Gentiles, the non-Mormons uh, in the community, we celebrate sort of a splinter holiday that we call Pie and Beer Day. <laughs> I can put a combo. <laughs> That's right. And so there are specials at breweries and restaurants all over town. Nice. Yep. You uh, are things out you, there. You partake in those specials yourself? Oh, absolute. A good uh, beer and um, uh, pie pairing can go a long way <laughs> on a warm summer afternoon. I'm well. <laughs> I got back from ASV, good. as did you uh, last week. That's right, good American to, Society for Virology good, annual meeting. Good to see you. You too. That was a fun meeting very, out at uh, University of Maryland College Park. Mm-hmm. It's, it was the biggest ever, I think, the, mo- the most registrants they've ever had. Yeah, good atmosphere. Uh, meeting was run by Stacy Schultz Cherry at uh, St. Jude over in Memphis. And I would say a notable keynote address. Did you like it? It was great. And uh, done by Vincent Racchinello. It's me. With a little twist. A little twist. Yeah, not the usual stand-up, mm-hmm. but I decided to sit down with a reporter from NPR, Michaeline Duclef, and have her chat with me. Yeah, that was really interesting. I enjoyed it. Because I, you know, these podcasts we do, it's just chatting, right? Mm-hmm. I shouldn't say just, it's chatting because we talk. <laughs> we get pretty serious. I like conversations. I think it brings out more in a in a topic than just talking, one-sided talking. So I thought I would talk a little bit about my career, a little science, and then talk about communicating science. And uh, it was a packed house. I was really nervous, but seemed to have mm-hmm. gone over well. Yeah, I thought it went really well. And, you know, we're so used to the whole, I mean, what is a keynote address in science, or, or especially what's a presentation yeah. at a big science meeting? And it's, you know, we kind of almost reflexively fall into the lecture format and so mixing it up a little bit, I think that got people kind of on the edge of their seat. That was the idea. I wanted them to try something different. Um, of course, it's probably the only time that will ever happen at an ASV keynote. Nobody else will ever do it. Someday, Nels, when you give the keynote, think, of, <laughs> think about doing that. Uh, don't hold your breath. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> because I yeah. think it's good to mix that. Well, my message was try something different. You know, science, we always do the same things. And it's pretty successful, I understand. But there's some areas where you can do it differently. And I've always thought ASM should do some uh, chats, you know, but they never do. They just give the standard PowerPoint talks. So that was my message this year. Try something different. So I was really happy to have the opportunity. It was really an honor in front of all those people. And I was te- I to tell you, I was sitting in the green room, which mm-hmm. uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a room behind the stage. You wait before going out. It's called the green room because they used to have green lights in it. It would come on. That's your signal to come out. Mm-hmm. It was five minutes before 5.30. What was it? What did we start? 5.30? Yeah, f- that sounds right. And, yeah. and Michaeline hadn't shown up yet. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm going crazy. I'm starting to think, okay, well, what do I do by myself? Uh, yeah. I just sit down in the chair and talk to the audience. I could do that. That would be fun, right? Maybe like a ventriloquism <laughs> scenario. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm texting people, where is she? Where is she? And then finally she showed up. And I, oh my gosh. You'd think she, she would show up a little earlier. But she told me later, you know, with radio, it's like 30 seconds before on air and nobody sweats. They're like, we're not nervous. We're cool. You know, yeah, it'll be fine. Don't worry. She said, nobody gets yeah. worried. <laughs> so, just work, yeah, working with the pros. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Then we did a twiv there. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, we also recorded an immune behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And we had a big, we had a nice picture after TWIV. All the podcasters there got together. We had one big picture. Then Nels and I took a picture. Then the immune people took a picture. It was a lot of fun. I had a good time. That was fun. And it was also, I really enjoyed meeting Ann Simon, who is one of the kind of local contact points for ASV. She has her lab at University of Maryland, and a great plant virology lab. It was really fun to hear some about her work. And I have to say, Vincent, I was a little shocked that, what was that, TWIV number 502, 3, something like that? 503, yeah. 503. <laughs> and you said that was the first time you guys have covered plant viruses. Well, she, she said that. Mm. But I think she was just ribbing us because... <laughs> um, we have had a number of episodes that are plant centric. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, this was actually sent in by a listener in the audience mm. who said, Here's a list of uh, great plant centric episodes you have recorded. So it wasn't, it was, I have a feeling Ann hasn't, hasn't listened to too many <laughs> episodes, but I may have been the first uh, with guests, all plant virus guests. That could be. Yeah. Yeah, which is that was really interesting, and she's great too. So it sounds like uh, one of her um, sort of side lights is she's a science advisor to the X Files. That's right, and kind of translating science in that realm. Really interesting. Well, after that, I decided to have her. I invited her to come on once a month onto TWIV, mm. and she agreed. So she'll be on to talk about a plant virus story, and then we'll get her to talk about her X Files career. Oh, fan- oh, fantastic! I'll be tuning but in. But she was very enthusiastic about that. I thought that was great. Same here. And speaking of which, congrats, by the way, on episode 500, which just happened. I meant to bring that up in our last Tweevo recording. So if I'm remembering correctly, you all went, headed down to Texas to celebrate 500 podcasts. That's sure quite did. a landmark. Yeah, congrats we on that. We did 500 in Austin at the University of Texas. And then the day before, we were at Texas A&M for 502, I think. <laughs> we recorded out of out of um wow sequence there but it was a lot of fun yeah we had a good yeah. time and and Nels in 40 years we'll hit the 500th episode of Fuevo <laughs> <laughs> 42 years Ooh, I think uh, we can do it I'll be gone <laughs> I'm going to be 105 I don't think I can make 105 well who knows who knows yeah yeah but I don't know you, if I'm around you still want to do Tuivo? yeah count me in all right yeah and speaking of Tuivo I spoke mm-hmm. with Raul Andino quite a bit at ASV. He loves Tuivo. Oh, great news. Glad to hear that. Particularly loved the last episode on, you know, neutral evolution. Yeah, so we had Matt Hahn. He loved uh, it. He said by. he loved it. He loved it. <laughs> yep. Well, I think we're we're doing what we kind of hope to, which is to collide different fields together, different worlds together, from virology to population genetics to I think one of the surprises for me is how much time we've spent with the insects since mm. we've started our podcast, and uh, actually we'll return to some of that ground today. I love it too. It's great. And one more thing, Nels, next year ASV is in Minneapolis. That's right, back to the University of Minnesota. And I think since it's in Minnesota, which is your home state, indeed, you should go. <laughs> I'm planning to, and um, already scheming a little bit on uh, putting in maybe a proposal for one of the satellite Mm -hmm. um, sessions at the beginning of the meeting. We'll see if we get any traction on that. Sort of a a Tuivo angle or certainly an evolution angle. I think that might be fun to consider. Yeah, good. Maybe we'll do a Tuivo at that ASV too, you know? Ooh, I like the sound of that. Yeah. We could do it. Count me in. What do we have for today, Nels? Yeah, so um, as I sort of mentioned getting into back into insect space, but sort of with a, a big twist here with a fungal connection. So the paper um, just emerged uh, with a splash, I would say, in the last week or so. I think it was July 18th from uh, Mike Eisen's lab at UC Berkeley. Um, the paper is entitled Entophom- Oh, I'm going to have to try that one again. Entophomphytovirus. Um, probably butch- butchered the name there, an insect-derived iflavirus that infects a behavior-manipulating fungal pathogen of dipterans. Hey, let me try the name. Yeah. Entomothovirus, because it's entomo, and then yep. P-H-T is th- 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 right? Entomothovirus. <laughs> wow, they yep. could have done better because that's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> it is tricky. So that's uh, the... 
pH TH, mm. but I think it's a stronger T uh, somehow. So. Is um, it derives from the fungal name. So these uh, that will uh, that will come out um, soon. But so a really so the and I should just say so and we'll get into some of the background in a moment. Um, but the paper builds off of this really interesting system that the Eisen Lab's been developing for several years um, and has reported on already. And this is this fungal um, pathogen of, uh, in particular, they're looking at Drosophila melanogaster, the sort of powerhouse genetic system, well known, the fruit fly model system. Um, and have been thinking about this uh, fungus that has this, as the title infers, uh, this interesting um, behavioral manipulating property. But then the twist here is there turns out there might be a virus underlying all of this. And so this feels like a nice uh, return to one of our common themes, the so-called hybrid TWIV EVO uh, mm. episode. And so here we are again, coming off the heels of ASV. So the, Mike Eisen, his blog was my pick last time, or time right. before. Not, it's yep. not junk, right? That's his blog title. That's right. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's not junk. <laughs> sort of a play on the idea of junk DNA mm -hmm. and the sort of controversies and hot air that has surrounded that conversation. Yep. Yeah. And so Mike's lab, um, uh, he's has been going for many years at Berkeley, probably most well known um, for his uh, pivotal work actually in his um, postdoc at Stanford with um, Pat Brown, mm -hmm. uh, some of the first microarray. Um, so tracking. Uh, you know, uh, transcripts, messenger RNA transcripts using mar micro um, array technology. This was sort of um, he and Joe DeRisi at the time were both postdocs and sort of emerged from that. And so Mike in his lab has done a lot with developmental regulation of transcripts uh, during the development of Drosophila. Um, and so, but this project has been picking up steam in the last few years, which gets into microbial control of host behavior and potentially, um, as this new work um, implies, uh, viral control of host behavior might even be um, in the mix as well. Hmm. Now you you just saw this because it made a splash, right? Yeah, it did, and we'll talk about this in a moment. So this is currently published on the BioArchive, um, and so Mike, in addition to his um, sort of science research uh, life, has also been a leader. Um, in the area of open access publishing. And so he was one of um, the founders of PLOS, so Public Library of Science, in the family of journals there, um, biology, pathogens, genetics, um, computational biology, I'm probably missing uh, neglected tropical diseases, PLOS One, um, this massive open access journal. So he was sort of at the uh, part of that origin story of PLOS. Since then, he's become a big advocate um, for BioArchive. And in fact, he and I crossed paths uh, last winter. We were over um, at a meeting from this emerging organization called ASAP Bio. And the meeting was at the Howard Hughes uh, headquarters mm -hmm. um, over in Maryland. Uh, and with some just conversations, actually with journal editors from places like Nature, Cell, Science, um, as well as folks from PLOS and related BioArchive, um, some of the, the people working on those initiatives, to kind of, you know, some conversations, um, at times a bit more contentious discussions um, about sort of the future of open access publishing. And uh, Mike is there, and he's kind of been mixing it up and is right in the, the middle of it. And what he is doing, I would say, is um, putting his money uh, where his mouth is to some degree. So he's been a strong advocate for BioArchive. Um, as we'll mention, I think kind of near the end of the episode, he's uh, when he launched this paper last week, he also did sort of a blitz on Twitter with a, a, a long thread sort of giving the backstory um, of the work um, as a way of uh, promoting it and sort of bringing people's attention to it. It's kind of an interesting emerging idea of how to, um, how to disseminate um, the science that we all do um, with some possible advantages to getting things out ASAP early and often, um, getting the information, I would say, um, out to folks quickly, um, but po probably some trade-offs that I think are worth discussing as well. What does this mean? What, what Where does peer review go in the value that that can add uh, to some work? Uh, how about people who maybe don't have as big of a social media platform 
sort of around them and how do, how does, does work disseminate from sort of all corners? I think these are um, still mm. open questions and ones that are worth sort of discussing and, and uh, experimenting with. Did you go to Arturo Casa de Val's talk at ASV? Oh, I missed it. So he, um, yeah. So you, did you see it? Yeah, I did go. And yeah, and I've, I've, we've had him on Twim before. I've heard him talk, but he basically addressed two big problems in biomedical sciences. One, the shortage of grant money and the fact that when money gets short, you can't really distinguish among the 30% of the best grants, right? Mm -hmm. And we're asked to make the top 10%, right? And that's just artificial. So he suggests that we should have a lottery, pick those 30% of the grants and then just get a, have a lottery to pick the winners. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the other is publishing, which is right now controlled by these luxury journals. And he said, we have to rest back control. And he suggested that bioarchive was the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, you put it there um, and then it circulates and you don't need the big journals anymore. But he didn't talk about peer review. Mm -hmm. You know, he thinks that bioarchive will one day supplant the big journals, but I don't think it will unless you have peer review, right? Yeah. And so that's, you know, that's, a, I think, a really big part of this conversation. So on yeah. the one hand, yeah. um, you know, so if you go through a more traditional peer review model, I mean, I would certainly say for my work personally, um, all of the peer reviewed stuff, including projects that, you know, are, we've been working on now um, have improved um, sometimes um, in very important ways um, because of peer review. Sure. At the same time, you know, there is a, I think there's a decent argument for it doesn't have to be either or. Mm -hmm. So um, putting the work up on the bioarchive yet, and then sort of simultaneously, um, going for, through the peer review process. That's what we're doing with a lot of our stuff. Um, and then, you know, even in sort of this um, uh, kind of bioarchive first uh, method um, in the, and certainly the tension that that causes with some of the journals, there are some, you know, experiments or some ideas that are kind of floating out there right now. Um, eLife is kind of involved in some of this. Um, HHMI has um, also made some moves in this direction. Mm-hmm. So the idea is kind of for the author to sort of take control back um, of the work in a sense. So that's, you know, part, a big part of what putting it on the bioarchive is. It's sort of you're deciding mm -hmm. when your peers will see it um, and see it widely. Um, but then the question becomes, could there be sort of a, a peer review process given that there is, you know, real value there um, kind of on the backside of that? And then journals, you know, might still persist, but as slightly different operations. So instead of um, kind of being the gatekeeper of what gets out, they might start to collate the things that are out there um, that then sort of pass a certain bar or have a style or, or kind of fit the collection for the culture or the editors um, at those journals. And then it becomes a place, uh, sort of a, um, you know, a collection point for uh, all of this work where people could still find that value in the work that the editor, so the work might be presented in a more professional mm. layout. Mm. Um, it might be, you know, have uh, commissioned preview pieces um, or even something that I'm kind of curious about. Could there be links to podcasts, like things that we do as we're tr trying to lift up yeah. work that we think is interesting and exciting. And so I think there's some real, you know, I don't, I don't know that anyone has the answers right now. It certainly feels like it's kind of a tumultuous um, moment for um, publishing more and more. Um, and so I think, you know, doing some experiments, seeing how things work and, um, and keeping kind of an open mind about how do we, um, you know, get our work out there. I think it's a conversation and in many cases, arguments that are, are worth having. For as sure. Forward. Conversation. Yeah. It's all about it. Yeah. And I think we, as I said, at the end of my keynote, we have, we have to occupy our science. Yeah. So yep. I I talked about it in terms of communicating, and it really extends to publishing as well. Take it back, like you said, mm -hmm. because the luxury journals make this artificial luxury by you know only taking a certain number of papers, and that supposedly makes them the best. But as we know, it's not necessarily the case yet. Promotions and hiring and funding uh, are decisions are often made on just where you publish not the work itself, which is not correct. That's right. And I also, you know, I kind of, I see some points on um, both sides in a sense too. So, you know, if you're someone who doesn't have 
a massive Twitter following or a social media presence, um, or someone who, you know, that this just isn't what you don't enjoy, um, getting the work out there. Um, one thing that these journals do as gatekeepers is work can kind of, in a sense, maybe come out of nowhere. It's some, you know, the, yeah, someone sure. working you know, on a different project on a, on a different, you know, institution that's, you know, maybe a little bit off of the, um, beaten path or something like that. And if the evidence, if the work, if you can convince both editors and peer reviewers, and I agree that's um, become, I think, an artificially high bar in some cases, but to get through, um, then you have the opportunity to sort of, um, as you know, someone who, uh, when I was a postdoc, someone said to me, the nice thing about publishing in these um, sort of high profile journals is that everyone reads it and, you know, kind of regardless of field. And so, if you can kind of, you know, still somehow have these collections of work that have sort of crossed through, um, but still, you know, that, you know, that possibility of the work, not the person, in a sense, being what sort of drives it through. Um, there's also, I think, some balance to be had in, in thinking of, along those lines as well. Mm. Well, we're not going to solve it today, but <laughs> that's right. As you said, yeah, so you got to have the conversation. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think so, yeah, I, I appreciate yeah. people like Arturo who make suggestions and start a dialogue, right? That's what we need. And so I hopefully, I, I think the key is that people have to realize that we have to have some kind of a change in, in grant funding, in publication. These are, are the major drivers of our field, and they have to change at some point. Just yeah. like I suggested about, you know, how to give a keynote, change it. We have to change these things too, for good reason, not just for the sake of change. Yeah, we're kind of trained as experimentalists, and so why wouldn't we sort of bring some of that same energy to the way we disseminate or fund work as well? And I actually, I, oh. just as a, maybe a last point is with Arturo's. I mean, he, I think, you know, whether or not you think there should be a lottery system, he raises an important point, which is that basically, almost by default, we do, um, in the sense that, as I get the you know number that you mentioned, that thirty percent that sort of first cut of grants that historically has certainly sort of identified a meritorious pool of, mm -hmm. um, you know, highly promising work. But then when you start to um, kind of restrict pay lines as low as five, 10, 15%, then discerning at that sort of that final, these final cuts um, in a sense could uh, given that, you know, we honestly, you don't know the promise of a field. There's probably a surprise that's going to come up mm -hmm. in anyone's research program that might be what really drives science forward. And so in that sense, you're almost flipping a coin or drawing straws yeah. um, beyond that, that well, point. That, so that's you know. his argument. It's already a lottery, but it's not fair. <laughs> that's right. It's that's not, right. it's yeah. not actually random as a lottery should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the U S government will never ever use a lottery. Right. You can, you know, the government is so mired in bureaucracy and procedure and rules, it will never do a lottery. <laughs> but the, yeah. the conversation about it is instructive and maybe it can lead to something else. I don't know what the solution is, Frank. Yeah. Well, I agree. Um, the best solution, I think, would be to fund science at 30% um, to make that investment um, across the board uh, because you, we would not be doing a disservice to taxpayers by funding all meritorious work um, after it's already gone through that cut down to only one in three uh, proposals making it through. It's when we get to yeah. one in 10, one in 15, where we really start to stress the system. as Well, well, as we Arturo start. says that's not the answer because then the system will expand and we'll be back where we started. You know, if you, if you give enough money to make it 30%, it will get more people coming in and we'll push it back down to 10. So... <laughs> See, it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> it is tough. And then I would say, let's even put more money into science until we get up to something closer to what we're already very comfortable investing in, say, military spending. I mean, some of the irony there, too, is that um, the military budget is so massive that they're increasingly funding biological research. That's right. And so, yeah, and so it's I, sort I just, of this. I just sent in a proposal for a Department of Defense support because they're doing so much. As long as you can say this is will improve the health of service people, mm -hmm. which is not difficult to do, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can apply. You and me both. I've got some applications in there as well. Um, yeah. But uh, we spend the NIH budget extra mural, I think is 35 billion a year. It's really nothing for a country of this size. It, you could argue that a, a much bigger investment would really be useful, right? Yeah, no question. 
because you don't want, I mean, the, it, it, you don't want to have talented scientists. And I would argue up to 30%, they're all talented scientists, right? You don't want them to close their labs, right? It's a waste. No, exactly. I mean, I would say it's actually beyond 30% are talented, but I would say scientists sort of by and large, one in three proposals that come in at any one time yeah, yeah, yeah. are kind of cross that bar. But yeah, it's, it's, it, there's even more talented science, scientists than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No question. Yeah. All right. Well, we could kind of talk about this, you know, all day and night long, but why don't we transition back sure. um, to this uh, interesting case of microbial control of um, insect behavior. And this isn't, you know, the first time this has been proposed. And in fact, this has come up on TWIV, Multiple. hasn't it? Some similar. Totally. Yeah. 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 We're really big fans of this uh, control. We talk about the wasps that deliver viruses to uh, caterpillars to manipulate their immune systems to be yeah. favorable to the hatching of the wasp larvae. Mm -hmm. Um, we have talked about the baculoviruses that infect caterpillars, make them climb to the top of the plant where they explode and spread the viruses <laughs> below. And yeah. then one of my favorites, the Puppet Master paper. Uh, it was TWIV 443 on a leaf. No one can hear you scream. Do you know what movie that's from, Nels? I don't. I don't actually, I don't. Alien. Oh, okay. In that space, sense, no yeah. one can hear you scream. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And that is a wasp that injects a, a larvae into a um, lady bug, and it goes with a virus goes with it that paralyzes the lady bug, yep. but doesn't kill it. And then the wasp uh, larvae hatches, uh, the egg hatches, and then it develops on the outside of the. Um, ladybug and the ladybug kind of protects it by shivering every now and then to scare away predators yeah and then the, the wasp goes away and something about a quarter of the ladybugs recover amazing yeah. uh, amazing i know it one of my favorite stories too i think this is from um nolwyn um deli and she now has her lab at stony brook um and is continuing to think about the mechanism in other cases like this so yeah i've also been fascinated by all of these stories that you're mentioning i was um was able to put this together. I'll put up, well, maybe we can put up a link. Um, I had the honor of giving the um, seventh annual Seymour Benzer lecture at the National Academy last year and decided to do it um, to hold up some of these stories. So I did it on the microbial control of hosts. Hmm. Um, and I've got a YouTube link that talks about um, some of these exact same stories. Neat. Is that like a keynote address? Yeah, so they have um so this is the the way I got into this was there's this really interesting program um called the Frontiers of Science. It's sort of co-operated by the National Academy and then the Kavli Foundation does a lot of the financial support for it. And sort of brings together scientists in vastly different fields for meetings that are um kind of largely conversations actually. So there's short talks followed by um, longer sessions, Q and A and just discussions. It's, re it's really inspiring, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Um, and then through that program, um, they will pick out folks, um, or nominate folks to give this, uh, the Seymour Benzer lecture, um, out at, uh, the National Academy headquarters in Irvine, uh, California or the location there. And so, um, yeah, I was picked nice. last year and was, yeah, I really enjoyed doing that. It was a fun evening. Great. Yep. Okay, so but getting to today's work, so a little bit of background. Um, the there was a grad student in Mike's lab, Carolyn Elia, and she really kind of started to spearhead this project. Um, and we'll put up a link to this uh, another um, sort of chapter in the story, or the first chapter on the bioarchive. And so um, what Carolyn did was she successfully, in a sense, domesticated uh, this uh, fungal strain, Entomophora uh, muscae. I think I got closer to the genus name there uh, <laughs> this time somehow. <laughs> it's kind of a tongue twister. Um, and uh, was able to domesticate it to inf productively infect Drosophila, um, where you can then sort of continue the, um, the fungal replication cycle. And so the trick to this, so that was some of these entomophora um, fungal pathogens were, were, have been known. Um, and in fact, I was just looking... I think you put up the Wikipedia mm -hmm, link here. Mm -hmm. Was I think that was first described in the 1850s. Yeah, it's and been, so that's it's a pathogen of flies, right? 
Yeah, and so I think the had mostly been observed most commonly in house flies, which makes sense mm -hmm. given the that they're around. And um, what people had noted, uh, you know, long before is this really weird behavior in the infected flies. So what they do um, is when they become infected, and you still can't see any sort of outward signs of it, but the flies kind of around dusk will sort of climb up to a high position as an echo of that treetop disease in the caterpillars that you mentioned with the baculovirus, which is one of, another one of my favorites. Um, and then the flies stick out their tongue, stick out their proboscis, and it adheres to a surface so that the fly is kind of stuck. And it's thought that the, the fungal pathogen is involved in that, the entomophora is involved in hmm. that. And then um, the next step is the wings of the fly kind of rise up and this gives sort of a launch pad, in a sense, to the fungal spores that are then ejected from the cuticle, from the abdomen of the flies. Um, and they're, and they're so gro they're growing on the surface of the fly. Is that correct? Uh, both internally, and then they um, replicate so much that then they start to emerge um, uh -huh. through the cracks in the cuticle. Yeah, so they, you're exactly right. They get to the surface. Um, but if you cut open one of these flies, whether it's a house fly or in the entomophora, um, in the uh, fruit flies that we'll be talking about, um, basically near the end, it, just as that replication cycle is about to go through that key step of the spore dispersal, if you cut open one of those flies, it would basically just be fungus mm. at that point. It's almost like it's um, been dissolved from the inside out. Really Lo lovely. striking. Yeah, that's right. It's scary. <laughs> so it kills the fly, obviously, right? Fly is dead at that stage. That's exactly right. But it's been the idea of this behavior, all, right, ever, all of those steps ahead of time, yeah. that's sort of this kind of, it's become a zombie um, in a sense. Also, you know, some similarity here between probably one of the most famous and uh, well-studied cases are the cordyceps fungal mm -hmm. um, s strains that are known to um, infect uh, ants, to turn them into zombie ants. Right. And you see some, you know, some of the same um, behaviors where the ants will kind of crawl up branches, get to the top of a tree or higher. They'll, in this case, they'll um, actually, uh, you know, the pinchers, um, they'll, they'll uh, clasp down to hold the ant in place. Mm -hmm. And then in those cases, the fungus can grow into these sort of wild, like antler-like structures. They attract um, birds, right? Yep. In some cases, track birds. <laughs> There's also um, spore dispersal as well from kind of that um, perch or that platform using the ant carcass as a platform. And so all of these crazy systems. Just think of having to, how to figure out how the fungus is manipulating the fly behavior. How cool is that, right? Yeah, I know it. And so, you know, that's been, so these great observations, but that's been one of the limitations. It's really hard to do exactly what you said, which is to go from the observation to some, um, you know, foothold on the mechanisms. How is it that the um, microbes are, mm -hmm. quote unquote, convincing these animals to behave in these crazy ways that promote the dispersal of the microbe? So it's easy to kind of see a logical kind of how natural selection could act on this, mm -hmm. which is the more it disperses, the more these things survive. And so you can kind of go down that pathway. But what is... You know, as like, how we like to talk on Twivo, what is it? What is it behind the, the scenes here? What is the mechanism? How does it work? And so that's where the um, Drosophila, the system that the Eisen Lab has been developing, I think, is really compelling because you have so many genetic and molecular tools that have been um, developed in almost the last hundred years that that might provide a testing ground to do experimental manipulations, both with flies and the microbes, whether it's fungal or as we'll get into the viruses in this case. To then say, okay, well, what what's really behind this? What is the mechanism? How does it work? Can you so that's, uh, can you yeah. genetically manipulate this Entomothera muscae? Do you know? Yeah, so that's that was one of their first questions, and so in Carolyn's work, mm. um, you know, part of it was they sequenced the genome of mm. this fungus, and that would give you the first clues to your question, which is, you know, what does the genome look like? What are the sort of prospects for using things like maybe CRISPR, Cas9? We've talked about that for mm. things like ants and so forth in some of our Twivo episodes. So, and this, they got, I would say, pretty unlucky in the sense that the, these fungal genomes are massive. <laughs> what do you <laughs> mean? Be, say, how big yeah. are they? <laughs> Give us an idea. Yeah, good question. So I don't have that at my fingertips, but I think they might be like 10 times bigger than a human genome. That would put them in <laughs> like 30 billion base pair wow. territory, if that's true. Um, this is a common theme. Yeah, this is a common theme 
that even some you know critters that um, look pretty simple, especially if we think about it kind of compared to us, that doesn't necessarily track um, with genome size. Um, yeah. I might have that number wrong. I might be thinking about um, um, a, a different animal, but let than me, this fungus. Let me, but let me Google. Yeah, it we can we can find it. I'm sure. Yep. So by having this domesticated or this um, strain, this um, Entomophora fungus um, domesticated in fruit flies. Um, and by the way, the kind of key trick to being able to do that, um, to actually propagate it in fruit flies turned out they had to take away in the fly food that they just used to propagate the flies, take away that an antifungal compound that would Mm -hmm. kill off the fungus for all when they were trying to get it. And so that was sort of one of the key steps in actually getting the system going. Um, but then they could, once they could do that, they turned out they could grow the fungus, both going through flies and also um, on plates. And so that gave them enough genetic material to think about hitting the genome, um, hit a little bit of a roadblock there, just as we were describing, because it was, it's such a big genome. Not only is it big, but it's um, chocked full of repetitive sequences. Uh, so, you know, it's basically um, littered with transposable elements. And these things have copied and pasted or cut and pasted themselves sort of the history of the um, fungal um, uh, you know, sort of diversification. And this has led to just a, a mess for a genomicist to try to sort out what is in there. And so this, I kind of wanted to just pause and, you know, kind of mention this. We, in the kind of post-genome era, we commonly will um, sort of throw out the sentence, oh, you should just sequence the genome of your bug or your critter, or whatever you're studying. And it's, well, it's really easy to say that sentence um, for a lot of organisms, it turns out to be hugely complex to kind of deliver on that. Even given the great advances in sequencing technology, it's really the annotation step. You can get billions of base pairs of genomic sequence um, through multiple platforms. But then when you try to assemble it and decipher what are the open reading frames, what are the um, protein coding regions, that's a much bigger um, barrier. To so it's uh, 1.2 gigabases. Okay, sorry. So I was, <laughs> I was off. <laughs> it's about one third the size. So big, human. though, for a fly, right? Yeah, or for a uh, um, fungus. Yeah, about sorry, billion, fungus. More, fungus. Yeah, more than a billion. So I found this website um, sequencing the E. muscae genome, uh, mm-hmm. genome assembly of the mind controlling fly pathogen E. muscae. Maybe that's the same thing that's in the it bioarchive is. paper, right? But this is kind of folksy. It says. It started out as an ordinary dishpan of rotting fruit used to collect wild fruit flies for an experiment. However, during cleanup, Carolyn noticed some dead flies at the bottom of the dishpan with evidence of fungal growth and their wings curiously raised at a 90-degree angle. Carolyn knew something nefarious was going on. These were zombie flies infected with the fungal pathogen. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I'll yeah. Put the, I'll put that link in the show notes. Yeah, good idea. That's really yeah. good. Idea. I agree. Yeah, another way of sort of telling the story. So then, you know, it, as they were kind of in this genome stage, one of the things that you also do is you um, try to do transcriptomics. So you try to get a sense of what's expressed. What are the genes that are being transcribed into RNA? Mm-hmm. And so they had all of these data sets. Um, and um, Mike describes in a thread that he put together on Twitter that he actually saw what looked like virus sequences at the time, he kind of made a note of it, but just assumed that these might be, because there are so many transposable elements, these selfish genes in there, maybe it's just part of the genome that's not assembling. Mm. And so they kind of filed it away. Um, and it was finally um, uh, later on that they kind of circled back once they actually got an annotation and realized, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't look like it's part of the fungal genome at all. It looks like it's a separate exogenously replicating virus um, associated with the fungus or infecting the fungus. And so then that's kind of what... In yeah, fact, they said, well, they said they looked at the genome, right, c- compared to the transcriptome, because they found the viral sequences in the transcriptome, right? Yeah. Then they said they went back to the genome, and they said, and this is from the paper, we were astonished <laughs> to find that the virus was not in our assembly or in any of the genomic reads. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, we exactly. were astonished. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they really thought that it was just part, you know, yeah. and that's kind of, you know, that's, it's probably, it's a good lesson in a way is that when we are, when you're sequencing the genome of something, you kind of assume that that's the only thing you're sequencing. And yet you're going to have, 
in many cases, as we recognize sort of the complexity of these biological systems, there's going to be hitchhikers, there's going to be viruses. I mean, this is the whole idea of the microbiome and, and other sort of, um, you know, scenarios of biological complexity that are, mm-hmm. that are out there. Mm-hmm. So once they kind of had that um, insight, then they could take that sequence and start to ask, okay, who does this look like? And here's where, you know, again, working with a um, really sort of well-established model system or research organism like Drosophila, there's another lab. This is Darren Obard's lab. He's over in uh, at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, the Obard lab has spent the last decade or so combing through, um, or I shouldn't say grinding up viruses like, Dros- like Drosophila or flies like Drosophila and uh, identifying or discovering the viruses that inhabit the different species. And so the Obard lab has put together this massive catalog of all kinds of different viruses that are just hanging out, um, replicating away. And immediately that allowed the Eisen lab to sort of pinpoint where the virus they had um, discovered with this fungus, uh, what it might be. And so that's uh, that's where now they had this sort of phylogenetic foothold so they could take the sequences from the Obard lab, put their virus sequences on the tree and ask, okay, what is it that we really have here? And it turns out to be, it looks very much like these picornaviruses that infect other flies. Mm-hmm. So, um, and not only was it, um, you know, not only did that give them the identification, but the fact uh, was that there were so many um, of their transcripts and some of the samples, it could be up to thirty percent um, of the of every transcript um, in the infected flies that were this um, uh, picornavirus, and so, or and more specifically, a, a, a subset of picornaviruses, the so-called afloviruses. And so, this brings us right back to those lady, those zombie ladybugs. Um, because the virus that was identified there, the so-called uh, DCPV virus, is in the family of afloviruses. Mm-hmm. Right. It's one that's known to infect the neuronal tissue of the ladybug to uh, cause it to become sort of paralyzed. And um, as you said, it just sort of twitches as, it, um, as the ladybug is um, holding the uh, growing parasitic wasp larva in its clutches mm-hmm. uh, as it develops and sort of defends it as a, this zombie Ladybug. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. <laughs> but in this case, the their sequences are coming from the fungus, right? That's right. And so in it's a, a three-party system, um, and with a little bit of an echo maybe on the ladybug case, but in the ladybug case, it's two insects and in a mm-hmm. virus, right? Mm-hmm. So it's the parasitic wasp right. that deploys the aflovirus um, as uh, sort of a two-for-one as it um, lays its egg uh, it also infects with the virus, uh, so the ladybug becomes a home for the developing larvae. Here, another three-part system, but instead of two bugs um, in a virus, it looks like a bug, a fungus in a virus. Mm-hmm. Now, we should emphasize that they they have um, grown the fungus on its own in culture in order to make the the genome and the transcriptome sequences, right? So there's no Drosophila here. So mm. this is a fungal virus, not a Drosophila virus, right? Yeah, correct. Except so that, yeah, and that's really an important um, part of the story because that, you know, at first that was the question. Is it, who is it infecting? Because it's sort of all three are associated. And so you're right. So they, by um, pulling it uh, or by culturing the, the fungus alone in seeing that the virus could replicate. And in fact, they show some electron micrographs um, just from fungus, uh, fungal strains that they grew on a plate right. where they actually see the iso- uh, icosahedral um, structures, which are totally consistent with this being an aflovirus. Mm-hmm. And so, but then that's, you know, that's, that actually raises this really cool um, point, which is that the viruses themselves are um, from that Obard lab work are quite well known to infect insects. Right. And so there are kind of two proposals here, which may not be totally mutually exclusive. One is that the virus has actually switched hosts. That looks like it, that has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so that it was originally an insect virus and now 
infects the fungus or sort of an alternate um, explanation. I don't know. I think there might be still, still some work here to work this out is that even so for all of the other so-called, you know, the afloviruses in these that are associated with bees and wasps and, every, and all kinds of different insects, are there also lurking in these samples uh, fungal pathogens? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, it's again, it's like you think you're sequencing one thing, but there's another thing in there. Yeah. And yeah. they do note that there is some, you know, as they went back, as they kind of got farther down the road with um, this detective work um, with the virus, they noted that, so I think in some of the OBARD um, data sets, which they mm-hmm. made all publicly available, that actually really facilitated the work just as a sidelight to be able to really um, just sort of go through all of this data. Um, what they noticed is, you know, so for example, the virus um, was found in only like one of 16 of the data sets. And it turned out in that very, that six, that 16th that did have the virus, there were also fungal sequences there. Mm, right. Whereas in the other ones, the other 15 with no virus, there was also no fungus. And so they propose at least for this strain that it might be an obligate uh, you know, or it, the it might it need the fungus. It might um, be an obligate pathogen of the fungus, basically. Yeah. Now, I think there is enough evidence just from the Obard lab of all kinds of not necessarily the, these exact strains of viruses, but other afloviruses, um, which may just infect insects. I think that's correct. Yeah, obvi- that's yeah. true. Yeah, yep, yep. Obviously, I think you'd still want to go back. Um, if you're kind of studying some of these systems. And in fact, I would be tempted if I was studying, for example, for example, cordyceps in ants, and maybe someone has already done this, but to ask, are there viruses there? Could yeah, there be, exactly, yeah. could there be sort of more to the story than is currently known? And you can clear this from fungus also, this virus. They found uh, some um, flies that um, they, they had derived some, fungal cultures from wild flies that had no virus in it. So you can find some uninfected fungi out there with this particular strain. Yeah, exactly. So that sort of um, supports the idea that the fungus itself doesn't need the virus right. to survive. Yeah. But I think the opening and obviously fascinating next question is whether, how mo- do you need that virus to manipulate the fly's behavior? Sure. Yeah. And I think that's probably what they're on to now. I mean, they say, um, so a couple a couple of things in summary here. So this is the first picornavirus to infect the fungus, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And they say, as you said, it's likely that the virus went from an insect to fungus, you know, and maybe we could get some clue about when that happened by sequencing more isolates out there. Mm-hmm. It seems to have low pathogenicity because mm-hmm. they say they see a lot of capsids in the fungal cells and they're fine. And then they say one tantalizing possibility is that the virus is involved in behavior manipulation. And we should say that this is, there's no evidence at all for this. It's just, it could happen, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So it's kind of a circumstantial case. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what makes it um, intriguing is, you know, some of those other stories that we've been talking about that have at least some loose connections. So the fact yeah. that it's an aflovirus that's sure. the right. thing that is sort of neurotropic for um, for the ladybugs. I mean, obviously that immediately raises the question, is this aflovirus also neurotropic? And I think that would be one of the first mm-hmm. experiments you'd want to do. I'm sure they're, mm-hmm. I bet they're doing that now. So there's a the first author um, of this paper, Max Coyle. Um, is a student in the Eisen lab who's sort of spearheading the virus side of this. I think if I remember right, Carolyn is now doing her postdoc um, at Harvard in um, Ben de Bivort's lab. So they, this is a um, insect neuroscience lab. And um, I mean, it'll be fun to see if she, I think she thought she was going into her postdoc with the idea that she was going to be kind of like a mycologist uh, studying this fungus, but she might turn into a virologist. Um, mm. as well. <laughs> we'll see where, where the story takes. I guess the experiment to do would be to take two flies, one with a fungus without the virus and one with a fungus with the virus. And if you had some assay for this behavior, this summiting behavior, you could compare them, right? And if the virus was required for the behavior, there you go. But if it works with or without the virus, then it's a different story, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And so that's where, you know, some of the other stories that have some echoes of this one, I think, become pretty interesting. So my one of my favorites that you mentioned before, it was the baculovirus that infects caterpillars mm-hmm. um, and causes them to to summit, uh, to climb trees. And then that as the virus is replicating and sort of dissolving the caterpillar from the inside out, you broadcast more viruses to the um uh, leaves below. Mm-hmm. So that's, it's an active area of work, which is, so in that case, there's not a third party. So that kind of simplifies the system. And so then you start to ask, okay, well, what is it about the virus? What does it encode that causes the caterpillars to become agitated or to mm-hmm. climb? Mm-hmm. And so there, um, there's been, I think it's a little bit controversial, sure, still an open sort of, um, you know, area of inquiry, but there was, there were some experiments where they, um, some groups proposed, and I'm forgetting the details on, uh, who did the work, but um, where basically they identified a gene in the baculovirus genome. So these are, as opposed to the afloviruses, the picornaviruses, which are sort of highly streamlined RNA viruses, um, baculoviruses are these massive DNA viruses, hundreds of genes. And in some of the cases, um, the, well, what they found was a, a host gene encoding part of a steroid synthesis pathway. Mm. And so that kind of got them onto the idea that maybe there is – um, sort of a hormonal connection that the virus is actually sort of um, using the host's own hormonal kind of responsiveness, encoding something to alter that, this gene. And so what they could do is go in and knock out that gene precisely um, and then do that, the assay that you're mm-hmm. describing. So mm-hmm. the summiting and what they measured, at least in some cases, was that the caterpillars didn't climb as much if <laughs> if they were inf- infected by a virus that didn't have that gene. Yeah, uh, cool. A- yeah, and then the gold standard, right, is to complement it. So you put back mm-hmm. uh, exogenously a copy of that gene, and then see if you have that specificity. It was and then and in fact, they do show in some of that data recovery of the summiting behavior. So that kind of you know that's a pretty interesting or compelling experiment. I yeah, think what's happened great. since, yeah, I think what's happened since then is that it's not all caterpillars or it's not all strains that sort of do that. And so this, mm-hmm. there's probably more to the story. Either there's redundant pathways or different system, you know, different kind of mechanisms at play, depending on the very specific species um, or strain right. of baculovirus. So more, probably more to learn in that case as well. But I wanted to ask you, Vincent, so as um, a coronavirus expert, if you, as you're kind of browsing through these genomes, like what would you, what, what, what does it make you think as a virologist about the possibility of how these viruses might actually have the potential to influence behavior? Well, bec- as you know, many of the picornas are neurotropic. And so that right there brings, that gets the virus into the brain and spinal cord. And that's probably what would not be a bad thing to do to manipulate behavior. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yep. I mean, I guess you could imagine peripheral infection generating substances that get into the CNS and do it, but mm-hmm. the uh, ladybug virus gets into the CNS, it's neurotropic and probably alters the behavior that way. So I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I, I think interestingly is whether this particular virus described in this paper can replicate in in insect cells without the fungus, right? Yeah, good question. Agree. Because yeah. I haven't actually done any infection experiments in this paper. They have um, already infected fungal cultures, you know, which they're growing and the virus is in them. But whether you could take the, you know, they take virus, they take the supernatant from these mm-hmm. cultures and they can see virus particles in them, but they didn't apply it to a new culture, right, as far as I remember? Yeah, that's correct. Yep. So it would be interesting to know if you can infect. You know, many of these fungal viruses are passed from fungus to fungus by cell division. They don't actually have extracellular phases. So Yeah, that's right. Yep. The fact that this is released into this, the culture medium is interesting, and maybe it suggests that it could get out and infect an insect cell. So that would be interesting to look at. But, you know, um, I think all... Everything's there for for manipulation, but it makes me wonder, you know, what do uh, viruses of um, animals, <laughs> the coronaviruses of animals do, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, course. poliovirus paralyzes us. I guess you could consider that behavior manipulation in a way, motor mm. manipulation, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and so, and there are lots of other coronaviruses out there. What do they do? We don't really look at that. It's hard to do in animals, but... And insects, you know, can do it. And I, I, I've, I've always, I've spent my entire career working on these viruses. And yeah, I know. I'm, 
you know, these last years of my research career, I was thinking I'd love to have something cool that I could work on with a technician, just me and a technician, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And th these kinds of systems of behavior manipulation uh, are very appealing. Yeah. You know? I'm with you. Yep. I'm hoping I'm not in my last years, but, I, but I'm also- No, no, you have a lot of time work, left. <laughs> I'm also working, I'm very, also really interested in, in trying to work in some ways in that direction as well. I you mean, one thing I guess- haven't, You haven't started anything yet, right? No, we haven't. So, I mean, the closest that we've gotten is um, thinking a little bit about um, how do these, for the large DNA viruses, so things like baculoviruses, how is it that they get the genes from their hosts into the virus genome? And so we're using vaccinovirus, the model pox virus, as a system to ask those questions. In fact, we've, we're making some nice progress now in a, a story that I think we'll have out in the next um, few months um, in the works as we're kind of writing it up. And so, um, but, you know, and so that gives that the mechanism of how these things might sample, but that's sort of off of the front lines of how do you, like, if, if, the, if a virus acquires a gene from the host by horizontal transfer, how is it then deployed? to change a behavior. Mm -hmm. um, I do think, you know, so the, as you mentioned, like with polio virus that causes paralysis of animals can cause paralysis of humans. It does highlight, and I think it's an important point, um, kind of the evolutionary thinking um, sort of behind some of this, which is that it doesn't have to be a really sophisticated kind of, um, you know, highly specific probe. It just by, ch by changing behavior, it can be something gross, a gross change in behavior that, just happens as almost a side effect to propagate the party that sort of hosts the virus. Right. Mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I guess maybe the farther along is that ladybug um, case where there uh, a paralyzed ladybug turns out to be really good at holding on kind of clutching on mm -hmm. to a developing parasitic wasp embryo or um, larva as it develops and then, you know, and that's a really fascinating case where the, a lot, as you mentioned, a lot of these ladybugs recover um, after, so the parasitic wasp develops, it's kind of sucking on ladybug juices a little bit, grows into an adult, flies away. But then in some cases, the ladybug can clear the infection and potentially become the target for another parasitic wasp. And so you can see sort of a direct potential line of natural selection there because what happens is this facilitates the ability of parasitic wasps to make more parasitic wasps mm. and the virus all it is doing potentially is just kind of temporarily and partially paralyzing the ladybug and so i think it's just maybe a word of caution that we don't have to kind of in like when we i think one of the dangers when we call these things sort of like zombies is that it's a really complicated behavioral manipulation mm -hmm. when even yeah, just sort of yeah. causing something as simple as paralysis when it's sort of in the right environmental setup yeah, can sure. actually go really far. Yeah. A couple of thoughts. One is that I wonder how frequent, so in humans, you know, polio, paralytic disease caused by polio virus is only one in a hundred infections, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I view it as an accident because the normal route of infection through the gut very efficiently spreads the infection and from person to person with little pathology actually in the gut. Yeah. So the CNS is an accident for mm -hmm. polio. Mm -hmm. I just wonder how, like what fraction of lady bugs are paralyzed? Is it a hundred percent or close? You know, maybe it's higher because it's evolved to perpetuate the wasp, right? Yeah, it's a good question. And I don't know that that, the, yeah, I think it's it might that might be an open question. And what is I think one interesting one is what's the tipping point? So, I mean, I think you you can still very much start your kind of the thought process with it is an accident. So you know the aflovirus somehow start it's neurotropic, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and maybe you know maybe from the parasitic wasp there's uh there there could be a fourth party there could be a fungus hanging out there somehow. Yeah, sure. And sure. then in the and then in the host switching you end up, um, just like you're saying, sort of this accident or even cell tropism, right? So that maybe it's infecting the gut of the ladybug, but then um, also has that side effect sure. to move into yeah. neuronal tissue. And then, but that's, yeah, it's a great uh, thought, great notion of how, what is, like, what are the tipping points for how efficient this sort of accidental spillover um, is in order to propagate? Um, but you don't, again, it doesn't have to be um, at the outset, certainly, um, it doesn't have to be anything more than an accident, and then it just gets yeah, selected out. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing is, this is the, the ladybug system is it would appeal to me because it's a virus and a 
ladybug. You don't need the fungal intermediate, maybe, as you do in the current paper that we're talking about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I could I could see you know infecting ladybugs. They get paralyzed, and then asking, all right, what viral genes are involved in this? What host genes? How did the ladybugs clear the infection? And I'd love to grow ladybugs in the lab. <laughs> I think that'd be so cool. Little red guys yeah, with, with black right. spots and infect them with viruses. <laughs> I could see doing that. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> well, uh, I think the Delhi lab is not too far afield from you over at Stony Brook. Could reach out. and. Uh, How do you spell the name? So it's um, Nolwyn is her first name. Last name is D-H-E-I-L-L-Y. Um, and she, and she works on so she, these, uh, these ladybug issues she, that we're talking she about. She does. Yeah. So that Puppet Master paper, I think she was first author okay. um, when she was a postdoc. And then now she's, I think for a couple of years, maybe even three years, has her lab in the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences um, as part of their genomics cluster hire mm. at Stony Brook. Yeah. Well, I don't want to step on anybody else's, so I have to find a system that uh, nobody's working on, you know. Well, I think there's a lot gonna, that are going to be out there. Um, I mean, I'm, I have to say like the, um, you know, and, uh, Carolyn and Mike and, uh, Max got together on this Drosophila project and it mm-hmm. took a few years to domesticate the fungus. I mean, yeah, they, yeah. now that they've kind of gone through that heavy lifting, you start to, um, sort of your scientific mouth starts watering given all of the tools that are available to manipulate Drosophila mel- melanogaster. And I think they're probably in a nice position now to really push this work forward. Yeah. That's it's cool, and um, I'm glad that despite all the problems we discussed with science, stuff like this can still happen. And, oh, that's right. And yep. I have to tell you that this work was funded by a Howard Hughes Award to uh, Mike Eisen, so mm-hmm. that's not NIH. You know, these are very rarefied uh, awards to a subset of individuals who are picked by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and you have the freedom to do lots of different things. The budget you get is quite high. It's over a million and a half bucks a year. So you can hire a lot of people, and you can do a lot of cool stuff. And you got you get seven-year boluses of money, so you can go for seven years, and then you have to renew it, and it's not easy. But um, it's different from the NIH issue, right? And I think that's good. Yeah. I mean, I'm in favor of sort of an all of the above for funding science through as many mechanisms as possible. Um, certainly that's a strategy my lab takes as we, as we mentioned before, applying department of defense, NIH, HHMI, whoever, whoever (laughs) will will support us. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll take a peek. Yeah. And so then getting back to, um, uh, you know, Mike's work just in disseminating science. And so going from his role as one of the co-founders of PLOS. Um, one of the things that Hank, he's doing in a, in a really interesting and effective way, and we'll put the link up, is uh, you know also tweeting out the work. Mm-hmm. It actually kind of made, as podcasters, <laughs> it kind of made our work kind of easy today because he, um, without having to, you know, get schedule him on the phone, you know, to get him to dial him up and have him on as a guest, which also would be fun. We'll keep an eye on this work and get Mike or Carolyn or um, others who are kind of working this down, down the road um, on the show to kind of from their own words. But he really, in a few tweets, actually kind of summarized a lot of what we were able to um, just talk about um, in the last few minutes. Mm-hmm. And so that also is it's sort of an interesting, I mean, yeah, it's an interesting way of disseminating science. Now, Mike can do this in um from a pretty effective platform i was just peeking at his um number of twitter followers and i think it's well north of 20,000 um 26,000 okay it's got, it's got twice what i have <laughs> there you go son of a so, bitch son of a yeah. bitch <laughs> easy easy so I he catch, i have to catch up to him that's right you've got a good challenge for the afternoon follow, follow me <laughs> listeners come on <laughs> there you go there you go <laughs> so that's a pretty good platform right you can immediately kind of have a megaphone in a sense. Well, we have um, a good platform here too, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, so we, we have many, many thousands of listeners, so I'm not complaining. I'm just being yeah, that's right. We're jealous. Just kind of, yeah, that's right. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, no, but that's right. And so I think that gets at, you know, not only, so if it's science funding, but also discussing science or disseminating science, yeah. what are the parallel platforms? And so, um, and, you know, I think 
it's not to say that everyone has to switch over to one way or another, but if, I think the more ways we have of connecting with people, with the ideas, with the work, and with the support, the better. And so, you know, I kind of tip my cap, I guess, that way to say, okay, this is kind of pioneering uh, a new way of um, getting the work out there. And it doesn't mean everyone has to switch over to that, or, that, you know, it could be combinations for um, a, a ways of, or strategies for um, just getting, and I think ultimately for me, at least, if we can, you know, someone, it, what we were working on or what someone else is, just the more collisions for the ideas in the data, the more availability that will ultimately drive science forward. And I think sure. we can all agree that that's, you know, a, a good positive thing. Well, as I said in my keynote, all of us have to communicate in some way. And I've mm -hmm. always been a big proponent of Twitter. I've been on it for many years before most scientists were on it because it's a pretty low barrier way of communicating what you're doing. Sure. And so Mike has really done it well. Um, I like to do multiple things because I think multiple communication platforms, podcasting, video, blogging, Twitter, I think they all work well together. But I told the audience, pick one. And if you want a low bar one, pick Twitter. Just go there and engage and talk to people, right? Yeah, no, that's right. You know, and I think also, I mean, Facebook has kind of got a bad name these days for uh, many reasons. Some of them I think are worth considering, but that is a way of also extending beyond. I mean, so I think what's happening on Twitter right now is that a lot of scientists are showing up and that's great. Mm -hmm. There are all of these sort of science to science interactions. The nice thing about Facebook, as you've pointed out, is that now you're going past the science audience. This is your uncle, your aunt, your that's grandmother, right. your right. grand, you know, your grandfather. And so, and remembering that that's part of science communication too. And ultimately, if we're th talking about funding and public support of the kinds of things that we're all uh, aiming for, that's that's part of the conversation that I think we really need to focus on as well. Totally. I agree. Facebook, yeah. everybody, you know, all your, as you say, everybody's there, your family's there, just use it yeah. um, and spread the word. You know, when I joined Twitter, which was 2008, there are no scientists. <laughs> Yeah, There's very same. few, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, it's great that they're all coming. And I've been saying for years, you know, just get on Twitter and start talking, and you'll you'll get into some interesting conversations. Um, paper we did. Let's see, where was that paper we did on TWIP the other day? I saw on Twitter. There you go. You know, you, you get as someone said, you get a lot of great suggestions from other scientists and even non-scientists as well. So it's good to, you don't have to be on it all day. You can just visit it for a few minutes and it will still make a difference. Yeah, that kind of stream of consciousness of it. You can just grab onto something interesting. That's how we got, you know, obviously this paper. That's where it was broadcast. Yeah, you dip in into the, the stream. That's right, <laughs> exactly. It's called the fire hose. <laughs> there we go. Because <laughs> it's really high volume. <laughs> that's for sure. Yep, yep, exactly. Nice paper. Yeah, it was look, fun. Look forward to the next ones, you know. Yeah, me too. I can't wait. It's been a while since I've run into Mike. I can't wait to uh, next time I see him to both congratulate him and kind of poke on and see what the next things that might emerge are. Yeah. Very cool. This is, by the way, in, in BioArchive, right? It is. So, of course, publicly available. Um, and either I would say, well, we'll put the Twitter stream. We'll put the BioArchive link, of course. And, um, you know, you can kind of delve in. I think uh, an all of the above approach is a good one. And I don't. I think Mike takes a pretty strong view that he may or may not ever have this go through peer review. Um, but I just would also mention that there are, certain, like, as a potential reviewer, I could see things that would really help to sharpen the message as well from the current mm -hmm. form mm -hmm. and by archive. And and to, so there's, all, yeah, I, I'm I'm an advocate for an all of the above by archive. Get it out early, but also um, the the real I think, quality and energy that can emerge from peer review. Now that's not to substitute our own critical eye for anything that has been peer reviewed. Um, but, uh, certainly from my own personal experience, it's, it's been almost uniformly positive, uh, in the short term frustrating with sometimes having to jump through some hoops that are not always, I think the most feasible or reasonable, but in the longer run, um, uh, things do improve by getting feedback, um, sort of harsh and sometimes, but in certainly critical and hopefully constructive feedback on the work. My colleague Ian Lipkin says the sole purpose of peer review is to block the publication of your competitors. <laughs> a little bit. It's a little bit much, but <laughs> yeah, sometimes yeah. it happens, right? <laughs> sometimes it happens. And there are humans involved in any of this, uh, any of these endeavors. We always go off the rails somehow from time to time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 
All right. Uh, how about some science picks of the week? Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I'll, how about I go first, uh, since it's kind of related to what we've been discussing. So okay. we've been thinking about microbial, almost exclusively microbial or lifting up stories of microbial control of host behavior. Um, I wanted to put a couple of links in my pick of the week to also think about, um, host control, not just exclusively from microbes, but from other parasites as well. And so this is a story. It's a few years old now. It was the cover of National Geographic, I think November, 2014, the story is called Mind Suckers, Brain Controlling Parasites. This is by Carl Zimmer. And um, actually, the cover of that issue is a ladybug infected with the aflavirus clutching at a parasitic wasp larva. Kind of looks like a glowing football that the ladybug is holding onto. Um, in addition to these um, parasit- or these uh, microbial cases, like the aflavirus we've been discussing, there's also some really fascinating ones. So one of my favorites is this um, horsehair worm that infects crickets. And then somehow, um, as part of its replication cycle, convinces a cricket to jump into a, a, a pool of water, a puddle or a pond or whatever, and it drowns the cricket. Um, and in the meantime, the horsehair worm emerges from the cricket so that it can swim off as part of its replication cycle. And so um, the images, the videos, and the footage is really striking. And so I also have a couple links here to the photographer um, for the story. This is Anand Varma. Um, and he, I think he won a, a World Press Photo Award as part of his work on this story. Um, it's really fascinating, actually, just how thinking about the science here or the really interesting biology, but then also um, disseminating it through these sort of powerful uh, images, photographic images and how he t- kind of took the biology in order to really be able to highlight, I think in really beautiful captures um, of, for example, the um, horsehair worm emerging from a cricket or crabs that are infested with these barnacles um, that change the crab's behavior. Um, there's a number of these, um, cases covered. So anyway, that's my pick of the week. Mind suckers sort of extending the conversation from where we've been considering it today. The great photos on this. Yeah. And you know, some really interesting ideas about, so like for the, the cordyceps, that fungus that we talked about that zombifies ants, he actually like has these like smoke sort of clouds mm-hmm. around it to kind of try to give a sense of like the spores that are, you can't really visualize those, but it just gives you a little bit of a uh, sort of, kind of an artistic way of um, trying to extend the story a little bit in a single um, still frame for something that's happening, you know, sometimes microscopically, or it's a process that could take, you know, hours, days, weeks, but to sort of capture all of those ideas or the concept in a still image, he really thought carefully about it. And so Mm -hmm. that's kind of, it's kind of fun to read about that and how he um, really got into it. And amazing photographer too. There's a great picture of a, of a ladybug holding a, a cocoon of a wasp. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, exactly. I agree. I don't know how they took this, but it's like beautifully lit and everything. They obviously brought it somewhere into a box and took this picture. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know, in the parasite world, you get, um, a lot of these stories too. We've talked about some of them on TWIP. One I remember, um, and I can't remember the parasite, but it infects a cricket, and makes it jump in the water because normally crickets yeah. uh, avoid the water, and um, and then of course fish will yep, eat the crickets. That's right. So that's the horsehair horse hair. worm. Yeah, and Anand uh, in the short video clip that I have a link to, he you actually see him. Um, tricking the horsehair worm out of the cricket by putting it in the solution and then how he's photographing it as it's happening. Yeah, it's, yeah check it out. So, really so cool. these crickets jump in, in uh, streams and what's so, and so forth. And a mm-hmm. paper we did on TWIP, they actually looked at this in a controlled manner and it has a major effect on the food web in the stream because the trout normally will eat algae on the bottom of the stream. Mm-hmm. But if they eat these crickets... Then they they ignore the the, the bottom they ignore the algae and the and the leaves on the bottom of the stream it overgrows it becomes screwed up and it just completely changes the whole ecosystem by having these parasite infected crickets jump in it's remarkable yeah no, I think this stuff is fascinating and highlights how you know as we're um, just beginning to glimpse at an understanding of the complexity 
of the interactions, um, how important, you know, and, and in a lot of cases, um, disrupting these really complex yeah. webs. What we, I don't, I don't know that we really know what we're dealing with, but and this is a nice example of how there's all of this underlying complexity at work that can really, um, be pivotal in how an ecosystem will sort of be balanced and sustainable. Mm-hmm. Cool stuff. Very cool. How about you, Vincent? What's your pick of the week? Well, my pick is a little shout out to Gregor Mendel. Mm. His birthday was July 22nd, mm-hmm. 1822. So obviously he's not around anymore, but just <laughs> two days ago. And of course, uh, he was the fellow who got us thinking about genetics, right? That's right. Of course. Mendelism, the science of genetics. So I have a little page from the Cyclopedia Britannica, which talks about a little bit about his life. Um, and I got an email from a listener, Anthony, who wrote, perhaps the best example of picking the correct model organism. Mm. With pigeons, Darwin was able to achieve intellectual orbit, but not break free from there. Mm-hmm. By the way, Mendel first used different animals for his experiments. His religious superior forbid that because he considered it unseemly for a cleric to be exerting the act of reproduction in animals, Mendel then switched to plants. <laughs> that was a good move, given the uh, connections that were he was able to draw between phenotype and genotype and to yeah. get at that sort of idea of a recessive trait. Yeah, obviously super fundamental and um, amazing how long ago that was, given the lack of tools and insight to, to really press that forward. I mean, that was a sea change for genetics, the yeah. foundations before it was called genetics. It's uh, why we need these kinds of scientists every now and then to pop up, right? That's right. And I think, you know, keeping an open mind about uh, from uh, taking advantage of some of this experience in our history, in our fields, which is to say that sometimes the coolest stuff emerges in the strangest places or the least expected places. And so, again, are, totally. we, really, are we sampling all of the possibilities around us as we're learning about all yep. the biology. Yep, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Good, good echo there with our, it's the unexpected, uh, fly fungus virus connection. Very cool. Yep. Well, that's it. We don't have any listener picks. Um, I don't know, our listeners must be on vacation, you know? Yeah. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll do it for Tweeva. That's number 33. We're well into, we're well beyond the, the phase of the number. Where podcasts mostly failed, Nels. I know it, Vincent. I think we're in orbit. We're we're, in orbit. we're now, uh, yeah, we're just circling around looking for great science to discuss. And uh, and not please, hard. yeah, it's not hard. And um, keep uh, coming at us as you're finding stuff. Feel free to send in listener picks, Suggestion. papers we should consider. Yeah. We all, yeah, we always uh, enjoy hearing from folks who are listening. So thank you. Tweevo is at microbe.tv slash Tweevo, but most of you will listen on your mobile device, your phone or your tablet. You have an app that you use. Please just search for Tweevo Subscribe and you get every episode. And this way we know how many subscribers we have. It really helps us to know that. If you like us, consider supporting us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. A buck a month from all of you would help go a long way. We did a lot of traveling this summer, largely because of our donors. That's how yep. we can do that. So please do that and send your questions and comments to Twevo at microbe.tv. Nels is at cellvolution.org. He's also on Twitter as L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Hey, thank you, Vincent. It was great to see you in vivo last week at the virology meeting and back on the airwaves today. Yeah, that, um, when's the last time I saw you? Probably at the last... Uh, I mean, you were here in the lab at some point, I think, in the intervening yeah, I, year. Yeah, that's right. I came by. Um, I was in the neighborhood and stopped in. We did an in vivo episode a few few back, and that's right. L- well, look if forward you to the next uh, one. if you come by, let me know. I'll keep you posted. I'm going to be out west next uh, this fall. I'm going to Stanford, but that's not close to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not if I if I come to Utah, I'll let you know, of course. But you're the only yeah. reason I'd go to Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep me posted. We're always <laughs> happy to host over here in LD Lab Studios, as you know. It's always fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I never forget that uh, episode at the museum. That was just great. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'm also on Twitter, P R O F V R R. Follow me. Push me up to Michael Eisen. <laughs> 10,000 more to go. 
Yeah. It's not, it's not um, impossible. I the agree. more, you know, the more you get, the more you get. That's the way it That's works right. on all these social sites, right? Tipping point. Music on Tuivo is by Trampled by Turtles. They're at trampledbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then, be curious. Be curious.